before, but I think probably a lot of you haven't seen it. And um, I'm happy to sort of you know riff on stuff if you have questions or if uh, if you want me to go into some detail on stuff. Some of this stuff is probably going to be old hat for folks that are sort of you know uh, uh, understand this world pretty well. But hopefully I can bring it all together and, and maybe give a little bit of new perspective on things. Um, so I'm going to talk about development and operations and how these things work together and how teams can work together. I'm having trouble with feedback. Okay. Um, and so development plus operations. So you add those things together, you get DevOps, right? Um, I honestly don't even know what DevOps is. No one so knows. No one knows what it is. So Kelsey, who's Kelsey, you still here, Matt? So yeah. Kelsey, we were we were having uh, uh, I don't know, we were having drinks or, or you know soft drinks, um, <laughs> and, and, and Kelsey said that DevOps is group therapy for large corporations, uh, which I think is totally dead on. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, it's easy to be flip about this stuff, but I think there is a kernel of truth here, and that kernel of truth is that um, we have to move to a world where developers have to give a crap about how their stuff runs in production, and folks who are running stuff in production have to take the learnings and they have to feed that back into the development process, and these things have to work together. It's no longer acceptable to throw stuff over the wall. So, in, you know, I don't know if that's DevOps or not, but at least that's one of the things that I think comes out of this rethink around sort of how do we actually relate operations and developers. Um, all right, so now let's mix in microservices. What the hell's a microservice? Um, I don't know, that concept's really fuzzy too. Um, I, you know, I, I could you know stand up here and have a bulleted list, but everybody's bulleted list would probably be different. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think it, this really comes down to taking applications, breaking them into smaller parts, and then accessing them over the network. Now, how small are your services? I mean, do we have Pico services, right? You know, do we have like every single function is its own thing? Um, I, I think part of the, 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 the technique of getting this right is sizing the services and figuring out where to actually cleave things that make sense for you and your company. Um, and I don't think there's a right answer for this stuff. But we need to build building blocks. Um, and so you need to pick the, the, the right building block for you. Uh, my experience here with respect to this stuff is uh, architectures grow organically. You know there's the Java architect, you know this guy? He like draws up like a gazillion boxes on the whiteboard and draws lines and like, I don't know, he has some sort of like, you know, if you use red pen or glue or whatever, right, it means something. And then it's like, okay, we just implement this and then we're done, right? And that always works, right? You can plan all that stuff out. The reality is, is that applications grow organically. You start something, you don't fully understand the problem. As you start to develop, you understand the problem more, and then you understand, hey, this thing that I thought was really one thing is really two things, right? And that's how applications grow. And so I think you have to always be refactoring. You have to always be looking for these opportunities to actually take your application, sort of like you know mitosis, the the you know cells dividing, right? How do we actually take these services and turn them into? <coughs> And, uh, and have the application architecture grow as your understanding of the problem grows. Um, so one thing that I think is interesting here is um, we've always, as computer people, taken big problems, break them down into small chunks, solve the chunks, and then put it all back together again. Right? This is how we build big systems. Uh, we've done this before with you know uh, uh, you know moving from assembly to like multiple source files, moving to object-oriented programming, moving to you know message passing, depending on your, your flavor of crazy language. Um, one way to think about microservices is that we're essentially taking the linker, the thing that actually takes all these different things and binds them together into one thing, and we're moving that into production. So now instead of linking being a compile time thing, linking is now a runtime thing. And we're not talking DLLs, we're not talking like you know, uh, 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 late bound objects, uh, object code. We're actually talking about across the network, right? And so this is why I think it's really fascinating when the, the Boeing folks came up with Linkerd, they actually named it Linkerd. Because um, it really does bring that thread through of we're actually taking this thing that used to be done at compile time and we're moving it to be, to be runtime. Now the real benefit here is not really around the code, it's about scaling your organization, right? How do we take a big project and break it down so that teams can actually operate independently. And so this is the real benefit from microservices. Again, this is probably old hat for a lot of folks in this room, but I think it, 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 you know, we get so enamored with the technology, it really pays to actually take a step back 
and understand why are we doing this stuff and it's really so that these teams can operate they can make some progress they can be loosely coupled from each other and and not be stepping on each other's toes so the end result here is velocity right you want to ship more product faster more reliably and that's what all this stuff builds up to so um, so when we talk about services I think it's interesting to say that not every service is actually created alike I think there are different ways to think about services uh, so the first thing here is is a service as an implementation detail and this is what you'll see when people have a monolith they'll take their big chunk of code they'll carve off a little piece put it across the network and then they'll call it a microservice these things tend to be fairly tightly coupled but you're starting to move in the right direction you're starting to actually sort of break these things up if you actually create the right abstractions, the right contracts with the API, you can have that team now operate independently. Um, the next level of service that I like to think about is, is what I was calling shared artifacts private instance. So this is where you have a service and the service is generic enough that everybody, that multiple people can stamp out instances of the service. Um, databases are a great example of this, right? So you can have uh, uh, one, you know, built, binary for a database, I'm not even going to say container, right? It could be a container, it could not be a container, but everybody uses that same thing and they stamp out their own private instance of this thing, right? So that's a great idea of, of taking this and being able to leverage this across, across multiple domains. The next step there is shared instance and sort of well, multi-tenant is, is kind of one of these things, but when you say multi-tenant, it actually sort of brings on this idea that you're going to take on sort of, you know, random people off the internet that are going to try and break you. Um, inside of a company, you can actually have something that's soft multi-tenant, where you have multiple users inside of that company using that service, and they're using it in a way that, um, you know, you have some, some boundaries, but they're not actively trying to break you, right? <laughs> um, and now, inside of a big company, this starts adding real value, because now you can actually start taking expertise, concentrating it, not just in code, but also in the operational expertise of running this thing. And then the final one, I'm just including this one here for, for uh, completeness, is, is what I've been calling big S services. So this is like, you know, you're putting an API out to the world, you have to worry about security for, you know, random people, you have to worry about charging them and getting all the documentation right and being super duper strict on versioning, right? So there's, once you start going to like, you know, big service as a product, um, you really import a whole bunch of problems that you don't have when you're keeping things sort of within a company and, and amongst firms. Now the interesting thing here is that as you start doing more and more of this, and this is what we saw at Google, you actually start interconnecting these things and, and you end up with a service network. You have services calling services calling other services. You have a single service that maybe has a large SAN in and, and it ends up being really efficient because you have a lot of, of expertise that gets leveraged widely across uh, the company. Uh, but uh, what it means though is that, is that you don't have anything that you can point to and say that's an application or that's a stack. It actually ends up becoming a, a, uh, uh, a little bit of a tangle, but that's also opportunities there also. All right, so now I want to switch gears a little bit, a little bit of a non sequitur. And I want to, that was mostly about operations, I mean uh, development, and I want to talk about operations. Um, so, um, real quick, sort of like, what's the difference between an SRE and, and a SysOps? Does anybody have a good answer? <laughs> Looks at Google. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah, okay, I'll give you that. Actually, so here's the thing, so at 2 a.m., everybody does the same thing, right? You just want to like make the bleeding stop and get back to bed, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the question is what happens at 10 a.m. the next morning, right? You sit around the water cooler and you actually say, oh man, it sucked last night. Like I'm gonna knock off early and go grab a beer because that sucked, right? Or do you actually have the support of your organization and the development team to say, I don't want that to ever happen again. Here's the 10 things that we're gonna do to solve that problem. And in my mind, that's the difference between these things. To, to, to really sort of internalize this, you have to continually be looking at how can we improve our processes so that we never see the same outage, we never see the same page, we never see that same problem again. Um, so that, I think, is, is in my mind, the, the difference between uh, uh, just traditional operations and, and SRE to Google. <laughs> um, okay, so, so uh, there's another spectrum here I want to talk about, and that's ops specialization. So one 
um, thought around DevOps is that everybody's in everybody's business, right? Full stack, I'm doing everything from the like kernel on up, look at me. Um, that can be pretty inefficient because uh, there's a whole lot of knowledge that everybody has to know to be able to do this stuff. And, um, and when you think about it, let's take cloud for example. Um, and, and I'm talking about sort of infrastructure cloud. One way to think about this is this is hardware ops as a service. So we've taken what has traditionally been an op role, racking and stacking, repairing uh, uh, machines, and we've put that behind an API. Um, and we, we've taken that ops function and we've been able to outsource that. Uh, that's great, uh, but we stopped there, right? Everything that's happening inside the VM, that's all your problem. Uh, one of the things with systems like Kubernetes that we can do is we can actually start creating more layering above that layer. Right, so we have hardware ops as a service. You know, what can we do to actually create similar efficiencies elsewhere on the stack? So the first thing here is, is OS ops. Um, and um, one of the things that we're seeing is this bifurcation of the traditional Linux distribution, right? So there's two parts to a distribution. There's the sort of lizard brain that gets the kernel up and running and all the goop that goes along with that. That goop is called systemd. System and then there's the, the sort of package management, like who's gonna compile OpenSSL and make sure that I'm not gonna get owned, right? Um, and all the stuff that goes along with that. And with the world of containers, we're seeing this stuff bifurcate, right? As you have you know, things like CoreOS or Project Atomic or Photon or you know, Snappy or whatever, name your flavor, you'll, you're seeing these OS vendors specialize on that lizard brain side of the house, right? And I think also with you know, things like Alpine, you know, the way that it's used is actually a package manager inside of containers, you're starting to see specialization on the package management side of the house. And I would expect to actually see more and more of that happen over time. So what this means is that you can specialize on having a, you know, a, a sort of purpose-built OS image, and you can outsource sort of running that image to somebody who knows how to do that well. Right, and you can make sure that you view that lizard brain as a separable piece from the rest of the package management that you're importing. Now, the next uptick here is, is cluster ops. So this is this is you know Kubernetes as a service, right? And because we have this nice API of Kubernetes, because we've created this system, we can separate out the people who run the cluster versus the people who use the cluster, and that's an incredibly valuable line to be able to draw. And so the cluster ops. Uh, their job is to make sure that they can provide an experience for all the people running on top of that cluster that is predictable and secure and stable. And we can outsource that. So we're seeing stuff like GKE, we're seeing um, Amazon solution here, or no, uh, 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 we're seeing uh, Azure solution here, and maybe even Amazon at some point. There's a ton of, of startups, in, in, including the, the Lutzi guys who were, were talking about this earlier, that are, are working to actually sort of enable to automate this stuff so that this cluster op role uh, ends up being something that you can sort of make somebody else's problem, um, which is a huge efficiency. And then above that, you have application ops. Now, this is where things get interesting because we're sort of coming back around to DevOps here. Uh, at Google, when you're launching a new product, um, the, app, the application development team is the one who writes the board configs and launches the thing on board and actually sees the thing out the door, does the monitoring, all the stuff that you would expect to actually get that stuff ready for production. So in that way, Google does DevOps, right? But they don't do the full stack of DevOps. They actually do the ops part only goes down to board, right? Um, and, uh, and, and that, that's, that works really well because what it means is that the developers actually feel the pain of what it takes to run this. Now, as projects mature at Google, you know, at some point there's always gonna be something going wrong at night. You wanna hire folks around the world so that you know, people aren't staying up and do handoffs and it becomes a professional job. So there are application level SRE teams at Google for very mature applications, right? Let's take search, right? So you have the search development team, you have the search SRE team, those are two separate teams. But you don't get the same conflicts that you get in traditional enterprises where you have the applications team, the, the development team and the operations team hate each other. It's like one from Venus, one from Mars, and they can't get along and, and you need group therapy, right? Because the application ops and the application dev teams, their, their goals are so much more closely aligned, right? The application ops team doesn't have 30 different customers that they're all trying to make happy. They just, they're aligned with that one application. 
it ends up being that the tensions there end up being a lot less, and it can be a much more fruitful of a relationship than you get with a general purpose obstinate. All right, so what are we doing with stuff like Kubernetes? So one way to think about this is there is a formula, and, and I have a longer version of this talk where I actually have a sketch of the formula up there. But there's a formula where there's a non-zero cost for launching a service, right? And as services gain in complexity, there's, a, there's an overhead for that that probably grows up, like, say, the square of the, the complexity of, of the service, right? And so you have to find, um, you have to find the right sizing of services that lets you balance the efficiency of having teams run independently with the overhead of running multiple services on the operations side and also the communication between those things because you're coordinating more things. With tools like Kubernetes, we're reducing the constants of that, of that formula. We're being able to actually run more services cheaply, which it actually creates a dividend. And this is what I mean when I say the operations dividend. If you can run more services cheap, more cheaply, you can take your operational capacity and you can use that to run more stuff. Or you can give the operation folks a weekend off. I don't know, it's up to you, right? But, but if we reduce those constants, we create efficiencies, we can plow that back into the business and actually ship more product faster. And so that's really what I mean by the operations dividend. How can we use tools to make operations run more efficiently to enable developers to do more and better things? So. There we go. Thank you. Any questions? What does eighty percent refer to? Oh, um, that's my blog, and uh, I got the domain. I do a lot of things that domain-based naming, right? I got the domain, so that's what I name it. Uh, uh, Kelsey was talking about the the identity thing a little bit earlier about identity. There's this other. Thing that I'm getting started up called PIPI, uh, Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. It's trying to think about sort of how do we actually bootstrap getting certificates everywhere in production. Again, that's another example of domain-based naming. I got the domain, so that was You don't have a certificate here. Uh, I do now, actually. I should modify that, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's encrypt is awesome. I, I was gonna wear the t-shirt, but I didn't. <laughs> Anybody else? I probably should have put Heptio there since that's the thing now. But, um, <laughs> all right, well, thank you.